Hunky Brewster won't be seen tonight, so we can bring you a very special episode of The Gen X Files. Welcome to The Gen X Files. I'm Jim. I'm Adam. And today's show is all about They Live. live. They they do. They live. Yeah, they live behind the scenes, baby. And they got bugged out eyes and weird looking faces. Yeah, they're all gross. Yeah, (laughs) they want us to consume and obey. Yeah, I mean, yes. Watch TV. (laughs) I mean, it's all pretty much stuff that I do anyway, I was noticing. (laughs) That's true. It's like, watch TV, eat, consume, sleep. Yeah, I mean, I'm pretty much obeying. And well, and like, you have this show, Jim. The show is the way of of turning it on their head. Yeah, we're <laughs> sticking it to the man <laughs> once a week. So t- take yourself back to 1988. Nice. May 11th, Ed Walters claims his fourth encounter with a UFO over the previous six months, who saw the UFO and took a photo of it, then lost consciousness for an hour. He'd released dozens of photos since the first encounter. A model UFO was found in his home two years later, although he claims he still doesn't know who made it. Uh, the aliens made it. Um, they took me up there, okay? They took me up in their spaceship. Close encounter of the fourth kind! <laughs> and then... Oh, just to, just to F with me, they made a model and put it in my house, so everybody thinks I'm a liar. Oh, no liar. Oh, no liar. <laughs> That's actually pretty close to Ed Walters. <laughs> That's pretty good. He's no liar. Uh, <clears throat> August 29th, at SummerSlam, the Mega Powers, including Hulk Hogan and Randy Savage, defeat the Mega Bucks, including Andre the Giant and Ted DiBiase, in a tag team match with Jesse Ventura as the special guest referee. That's when I watched wrestling. I wrestling know. was so good <laughs> I know, back then. Same, same. With all those guys, they were the best. I mean, no offense to The Rock and all those guys. Sure, sure. But they wouldn't be here if these... Crazies oh, no, didn't no. pave the way. Oh, the, 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 so the, the every I just love the fact that it was the Mega Powers versus the Mega Bucks. Yeah. <laughs> like the whole thing is just it's like so the dumb. Lottery. It's so dumb. But who won? Great. Who won? Uh, I believe the Mega Powers won. I think it was Hogan and Savage. Probably. Because Andre yeah. the Giant was a bad guy. Uh, he did. He was the heel for a lot. And Ted DiBiase definitely was. Yeah. 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 Jesse the Bod Ventura. Yeah. He he was governor at one point. <laughs> yeah, he was. <laughs> he was governor. He he was a pretty good governor. Yeah, yeah. He was I I I was living in Iowa when he was governor of Minnesota and I gotta be honest, I was a little jealous because if it bleeds, we could kill it. Our governor was terrible. So it was but he was just no nonsense. He was good. I mean yeah. I didn't yeah. Uh, I do also find it very interesting that now two people from the movie Predator have become governors of states. Yes, the government. October 27th, Ronald Reagan decides to tear down the new U.S. embassy in Moscow because of Soviet listening devices in the building structure. (laughs) November 4th, They Live is released in theaters. Yeah! Uh, So obviously, They Live starts with John Carpenter. Uh, By the end of this month, we will have covered John Carpenter more than any other director. As we should. Yeah. uh, He's one of my favorite he's in the top five man oh yeah yeah i i can't wait until we get to uh the thing yeah because that's like my favorite horror movie ever it's the best all of his movies are great this movie is so uh, like ahead of its time yeah and just so prescient about like it's just so great that they took the biggest knucklehead weirdo (laughs) (laughs) and and i love rowdy rowdy piper but they just took this weird knucklehead weirdo and made him like the face of uh, fighting fascism or whatever, yeah, yeah, alien fascists. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's just so it's, it's <laughs> such an amazing film. And any movie that has a third of the film is one fight scene. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's ballsy, baby. It's true. That's true. Carpenter was interested in films from an early age, particularly the westerns of Howard Hawks and John Ford, as well as 1950s low budget horror films such as The Thing from Another World and high budget science fiction like Forbidden Planet, and began filming horror short films with 8mm film even before starting high school. Wow. It's expensive, man. Yeah. I'm you sure gotta his, send it away. His parents were like, Another movie? <laughs> yeah, I gotta make movies. Uh, Carpenter made it big with his seminal Halloween film, Halloween. (laughs) Yes. What a great movie, too, by the way. You know what's not a great movie? 
uh, the new one. Halloween, Halloween ends. ends. Should have ended the movie before. Uh, I've heard that it's a good horror movie, just not a good Halloween movie. Mm, uh, I Here's the thing, and this is what frustrates the S out of me mm-hmm. with streaming services and Universal. I've not seen Halloween from 2018. I've not seen Halloween Kills. Which were pretty good. Halloween Ends is available now. Why aren't those available? I want, want to watch all three of they them. They want you to rent them, baby. Yeah, they but now I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna watch Halloween Ends now. See Peacock, you effed up. Yeah, Adam's not watching it. Yeah, Adam's not and that's watching his, it. That is a lot of hours. And the way Adam goes, the way the country goes, baby. Yeah. So yeah. you're effed. Look, I really enjoyed the big old fight between the two of them. Yeah, Thought it was cool. Yeah. Um, but was it as long as the fight no, when they no, live? No. <laughs> There's no <laughs> such thing as a like. Like you could watch a, a whole wrestling, a whole other movie, event, <laughs> and it wouldn't movie, be as yeah. much as the is this amazing fight scene. The uh, the SummerSlam Mega Powers versus Mega Bucks actually was shorter. <laughs> yes, yeah. exactly. But anyway, uh, watch it. See okay. What you think. I mean, I I do want to see them. I mean, it's just that they haven't been easily available. Yeah. And and I although now I think Halloween Kills is on HBO Max or something, but. I can't find to the 2018 Halloween, and it's yeah. like it's a trilogy. I want to see it from yeah. the beginning. No, I, you should. Yeah, but yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it's not as it good. Doesn't, but, it doesn't take anything away from the original. Long Halloween. story short, the original Halloween is the best one of the yes, bunch, and yes. every other one is pretty much crappy. I mean, let's be honest. It's why all they of the had Halloween to reboot it constantly because they were trying to capture that magic, and it just it can't look. The original film is brilliant. And it's nicely self-contained. Yeah. Yes. And the second yes. one was pretty interesting because it took place right afterwards. Yeah. It was. A lot of stuff it expanded, and it, and it. Yeah. But you know, it didn't get any better from there. No. And if you go back over the oeuvre, I don't think Hall- Halloween ends is any worse than any right. of the other horrible pieces of ass that were made under the Halloween I, banner. I, my, my favorite will always be Halloween three because it had nothing to do with I anything. I love Season else. of the Witch. Yeah. I think it's totally underrated. Yeah. I think it was. I remember seeing that in the theater with my grandma. I feel like that's where the series should have gone. They should have gone away from Michael Myers and just continued Halloween stories, yeah, like stories, crazy yeah. stuff. Yeah, Halloween Three: Season of the Witch was a bold choice <laughs> that didn't hit, but I liked it. I agree. It was scary. Masks, man. Yeah, yeah. Putting on it's masks, frightening. getting yeah. brainwashed. It's like they live. <laughs> Another consumer uh, nightmare. Yeah, yeah Another, that's true. Uh, cautionary tale about consumerism. That is true. That is true. Try to get us back on track. All right. (laughs) Uh, So after Halloween, obviously John Carpenter could do whatever he wanted. He made a bunch of movies. Uh, In 1986, he did Big Trouble in Little China, which we've already covered. But it was financially a failure, unfortunately, making just over $11 million off the $25 million budget. Uh, and it's like, it's now just such a it's huge, huge cult now. Yeah, yeah. They're talking about making a new one with The Rock. Yeah. Uh, the problem is, at the time, because it didn't make money, nobody would give Carpenter money anymore. Well, they didn't know how to market it, and they yeah. didn't market it correctly. Because well, it does, I, That doesn't matter. I, I mean, know. I agree. I but it's just, Bob, it's the executive, those... just sees numbers. Hey, guys. <laughs> I heard my name. My, Sorry. my ears were bleeding. Yeah. Not because of what you said, just bad. Um, <laughs> All right, Bob. Uh, bad uh, plastic surgery. Uh, so does it come down to numbers for yeah, you? Yeah, definitely. I mean, look, let's be honest. The only color that matters is green. <laughs> and, um, and not that red that's coming out of your ears? Oh, okay. God, it hurt so bad. <laughs> One of my kids jammed a pencil in there. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, my kids are troubled. I can tell. Yeah, uh, I better go get them. All right. <laughs> I left him thanks, outside Bob. again. Oh, okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks for stopping by. Ugh, yeah, blood everywhere. Uh, that was. That was. <laughs> let's get a mob. Jesus. <laughs> uh, I about Bob. So he resumed making lower budget films such as Prince of Darkness in 1987. Totally underrated. Agreed. A film influenced by the BBC BBC series Quatermass, uh, which I watched the original 1953 Quatermass experiment. I think I actually call him Quatermass. It's super weird. What does that mean? I have no idea. It's his name. I, oh, his name is Quater name Mask? Is, he's Dr. Quater, 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 Quater Mask. I think it's Quater Mask. Mass. It's so hard to say. Why would they do that? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, so Prince of Darkness did fairly well, garnering $14 million off of a $3 million budget. So he's proven himself again. Uh, the idea for They Live came from a short story called Eight O'Clock in the Morning by Ray Nelson, originally published in the Magazine of Fantasy and Science Fiction in November of 1963, involving an alien invasion and the tradi- tradition of invasion of the body snatchers. Man, 
Invasion of the Body Snatchers, they made that a bunch of times. But I oh, think the best so one yeah. is the is the yeah yeah the, the, sorry Donald Sutherland. Doing the Donald Sutherland point <laughs> yeah uh, oh, oh so so scary so at the end and his face man his face oh, Donald it's Sutherland. creepy it is it is one of the most unsettling movies I've ever seen oh uh, like, uh, it definitely is, it is definitely so good, so good. Uh, and speaking of good uh, Donald Sutherland is in the Mr Harrigan's Phone oh Stephen yeah Stephen King adaptation on yeah. Netflix which I really enjoyed nice it's okay. a nice like. It's a nice, easy-going thriller kind nice. of thing. Okay. It wasn't too crazy or violent or whatever. It just was like a nice little ride. Yeah, okay. That's good to know. Ray Nelson claims to have invented the iconic propeller beanie that became synonymous with sci-fi nerds in the 1950s. Really? This was literally his claim to fame. He talks about it all the time. <laughs> Don't know why? Well, he's a writer. A, I mean, he's sure, a writer. But like, he, like, where did that come from? I don't know. The propeller beanie. I don't know. And it's... I don't know if sci-fi nerds wear the propeller beanie. It seems to me Same. that just idiots wear it. They I put them on to make agreed. You know, like Tweedledee and Tweedledum wear. A I think it's. Beanie. I think it's. Yeah, I think so. Something I, I, to that. You kind of. Yeah. Well, good for him. I don't know. Have don't you ever know. worn one? No, I did. Okay. I don't know why, but I had one. Because you had to. It was mandated by the government. Hey, look, if you're a certain age, you had a propeller beanie. <laughs> I did not. I was. They too were young. issued was to you in young. school. Yeah. So Ray Nelson actually wrote a novel with Philip K. Dick in 1967 about an alien invasion called The Ganymede Takeover. Uh, they'd actually been friends since childhood. Uh, Nelson actually says that the two times he did LSD were with Philip K. Dick. That would be fun. Hi. To, to do with LSD L- with Philip K. K. Dick? Dick? I don't man. know, man. Did you ever read the Valis trilogy? <laughs> yeah, but it just... Dude got insane. It'd be funny if he was just like, hey, you know... Ooh, I really like unicorns and puppy dogs, and let me tell you a story about a little kitty who lost his way. No, instead he was talking about the giant AI in the sky that was controlling everything. Yeah, but maybe when he was on LSD, he changed and was talking Possibly. about puppies and kitties. Although, I will say, Philip K. Dick, at one point, he, well, I think it was while he was on LSD, claimed that this Vallis thing talked to him and told him about his son having a certain tumor or something, that he then took his kid to the doctor and they found this tumor. Okay, so, I'm sold. There you go. <clears throat> Philip K. Dick, the uh, purveyor of the future. <laughs> I'm just going to say this. I'm not a proponent or against, but uh, there's a lot of mystery with LSD and mushrooms. And That's true. There's That's true. a lot of benefits to it, apparently, Yeah. for uh, PTSD and mm-hmm. for anxiety and for even, like, quitting smoking and stuff. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. uh, there's a lot of medicinal benefits to yeah. this. There's there's a few people I know that uh, microdose the mushrooms now because yeah. it helps with the depression and stuff like that. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's I've tried that. Yeah. And it's uh it's just kind of it's like coffee, but everything's a little wiggly. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So Ray Nelson also taught writing to Anne Rice in the 1970s. Nice. Should have so, taught her a little better. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm totally joking. <laughs> I've never read any Anne Rice. So She's no great. I, I loved Interview with a Vampire. Yeah. Uh, that, I read all of those books in college and really enjoyed them. Nice. Um, she's great. Okay. That's good. I mean, the, yeah, the movie's great. I just have never read. It's never been my thing. The books are so much better than the movie. Oh, I, well, sure. It's always. Sure. But, but it's one of those things where they, they didn't get it as good as they did. I'm hoping the series will get it. Interesting, because I really liked Interview with the Vampire. Oh, it's a good movie. movie. It's a good movie. It's fine. It's just it missed a lot of the really intricate parts of the story that you know made it a little bit more fleshed out. I I, I then I'm more curious to see the show now. Uh, John Carpenter describes Nelson's story as a DOA type of story in which a man is put in a trance by a strange hypnotist. When he awakens, he realizes that the entire human race has been hypnotized. And that alien creatures are controlling humanity. He has only until 8 o'clock in the morning to solve the problem. All right. <laughs> That's yeah. pretty much the summary of 8 nice. o'clock in the morning. It's like uh, 3 o'clock high. <laughs> <laughs> Nelson, along with artist Bill Ray, adapted 8 o'clock in the morning into a story called Nada, published in the Alien Encounters Comics Anthology in April of 1986. Uh, Bill Ray has had a featured series that appeared in more than 100 issues of Mad Magazine. Oh, I probably saw it. Yeah, he had an ongoing thing that he wrote and draw in the 80s, yeah. What was it? I don't remember what it was called. I didn't write it down, so <sighs> I don't know. Because I, I could probably tell I'm you. I'm sure. I'm sure. I mean, it went over 100 issues. Like, I imagine you probably read most of them. Oh, yeah. We got a, 
archive in the Maybe closet. Check it out. I'll yeah. look to see when the dates are. We have a bunch of old. I imagine it was between eighty four and ninety, probably, or maybe early sometime in the right. in the eighties. Uh, he would go on to work on the Ren and Stimpy show and Samurai Jack. Nice, both great shows. Yeah, both very fantastic. I'm in the middle of watching Samurai Jack right now, and it is the weirdest, most amazing Hanna Barbera cartoon I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty. Uh, it's different. <laughs> it's for it's sure. sure. It's amazing. Uh, Carpenter acquired the film rights to both the comic book and short story, and wrote the screenplay using Nelson's story as a basis for the film structure. Because the screenplay was the product of so many sources, a short story, a comic book, and input from cast and crew, Carpenter decided to use the pseudonym Frank Armitage. Frank Armitage is an allusion to one of the filmmaker's favorite writers, H.P. Lovecraft. Henry Armitage is a character in Lovecraft's The Dunwich Horror. Carpenter has always felt a very close kinship with Lovecraft's worldview, and according to the director... Lovecraft wrote about the hidden world, the world underneath. His stories were about gods who were repressed who were once on Earth and are now coming back. The world underneath has a great deal to do with they live. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I could see how he's very influenced by Lovecraft. Sure. Uh, especially mostly seen in his Apocalypse trilogy, which he calls, the, which includes The Thing in 1982, which we'll be covering later, Prince of Darkness in 1987, and In the Mouth of Madness in 1994, which has very heavy allusions to Lovecraft's works. Carpenter has said that the film's political commentary derives from his dissatisfaction with the economic policies of then-U.S. President Ronald Reagan and increasing commercialization in both the popular culture and politics of the era. Upon the film's re release, he remarked, The picture's premise is that the Reagan revolution is run by aliens from another galaxy. Free enterprises from outer space have taken over the world and are exploiting Earth as if it's a third-world planet. As soon as they exhaust all our resources, they'll move on to another world. I began watching TV again. and quickly realized that everything we see is designed to sell us something. It's all about wanting us to buy something. The only thing they want to do is take our money. <laughs> yeah. That is pretty much Reaganomics. <laughs> it's pretty <laughs> much Ameronomics. Yeah, yeah, it's true. That is true. So after he finished the script, uh, they moved on to casting. Uh, he cast Rowdy Roddy Piper as Nada. Nada mm. was originally written with Kurt Russell in mind, but after having worked with him four times in the previous ten years, he decided to try another actor for the part. Oh, he would have been great. He would have, and I get it. I mean, he's worked with him for a long time, but I there's still something about Roddy Piper. But uh, they considered a ton of other actors like... Alec Baldwin, Michael Bean, Brian Bosworth, Jeff Bridges, Bruce Campbell, Tom Cruise, Harrison Ford, Mel Gibson, Tommy D. Jones, Michael Keaton, Christopher Lambert, Stephen Lang, Dolph Lundgren, Michael Madsen, Bill Paxton, Ron Perlman, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Sylvester Sloan, Patrick Swayze, Jean-Claude Van Damme, and Bruce Willis. What, did they just, every actor working that day, they... I, given the movie's budget, a large portion of those actors couldn't have been seriously considered. Yeah, Harrison Ford... It, no. Schwarzenegger in, in 88 was not going to be, you weren't going to be paying him uh, on a $3 million budget. Hey, how you guys doing? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, it was really serious for me, you know, because it costs a lot of money to get a guy like this, you know, with a body like this. You know, go get it cheap. I, I am sure that somebody, he probably just wrote down a wish list and it was like, okay, nobody, I, I don't think anybody on, on this list was seriously considered. Well, I also don't think many people on this list would have done a better job. I think Rob, Ron Perlman would have been great. Yeah. I think um, uh, Bill Paxton would have been really interesting. Um, but I don't think Arnold – it's no. not an action movie. No, it's, it's you not. You don't need it's an not. action guy. You need an everyman. Right, I mean, that's the thing. Right. Rowdy Roddy Piper, even though he was a professional wrestler, he was still just kind of a – you know, he, he just was a, a dude, big yeah. lug. He's just a lug. He looks like a laborer that could go he, he does. He from does. place to place. You know, it's like he, he, they picked the right guy. Yeah, yeah. Carpenter decided to cast somebody more naturally rugged. Uh, he had actually met Roddy Piper during WrestleMania three in 1987, mainly because Carpenter has always been a huge pro wrestling fan, having written a column for The Ring magazine for a little while. Yeah, Carpenter's rad. He's also a huge video game fan. Yeah. And uh, I read an article. He basically plays exactly what we play. Oh, nice. He likes nice. Red Dead yeah. 2. He, likes, uh, he really got into... Uh, Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Oh, nice, nice. Um, <laughs> that's so funny. I just imagine him sitting around playing video games. <laughs> he loves him. Ah, that's why I love him. I love him so much. Roddy Piper, whose real name is Roderick George Toombs, was raised in Winnipeg, Canada. Mr. Toombs. 
<laughs> I just love the tombs. It's such a great name. Rowdy Rowdy Tombs. Yeah. <laughs> After being expelled from junior high for having a switchblade in school. Bad boy. And falling out with his father, Piper left home and stayed in youth hostels. I fell out with my father. He's got the weirdest, like, it's, yeah. it's like a combination of American and, and and a bit of Canada and a little bit of a Scottish yeah, accent. Yeah, yeah. It's like, it's impossible. <laughs> It's super weird. I'm all I'm here to chew bubble gum and kick ass, and I'm all out to bubble gum. That's close. A little too much Scottish, <laughs> but like it's no, close. It's that was there. close. It just sounds so it weird. It is. It is very odd. Uh, he picked up odd jobs at local gyms, running errands for several professional wrestlers. As a young man, he became proficient in playing the bagpipes, though he repeatedly has stated that he was unsure exactly where he picked them up. <laughs> That's odd. Because it's a big old thing to pick up. And it's in the top three of horrible instruments. It's living on the streets and playing the bagpipes. Oh, the bagpipes. Ugh. Oh, yeah, I know. Although when, when played well. It still sounds When played awful. well. Nope. Nope. <laughs> I disagree. I disagree. Nope. So Roddy Piper was actually homeless for a while after he left. I mean, he, he lived in a lot of encampments. He talked about how the the homeless scene like really brought back a lot of bad memories for I him. Bet. They and, did it. I mean, they, they played yeah. that pretty, pretty real. Yeah. Know? Yeah. That whole area where they did all that is still undeveloped. Like it's never, it's still this weird, scrabbly, messed up area that, yeah. Oh. I, I mean, it still has a lot of homeless people living there. Yeah. Well, there's a. I mean, let's not get into it, but there's yeah. a huge homeless problem in yes. Los Angeles. Yes. And you know how bad it is because it was bad back then in 88. Yeah. yeah. And it's worse now. It is. It is. So soon after he started, he turned to professional wrestling to earn money. He actually has a black belt in judo. Uh, Piper actually gave up wrestling in the WWF to act in They Live. You know, I think it's easy to get a black belt in judo because it seems like so many people have judo black belts. I I mean maybe it is. I'm gonna try. All right. I'm gonna pro- I'm gonna go, and by the time we do the next show, I'll probably have a black belt in judo. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it is horribly disrespectful to the people that have actually gotten a black belt in judo. We'll see. But, uh, so yeah, he gave up wrestling in the WWF to act in They Live. Uh, Vince McMahon didn't like the idea of Piper being in the movie, most likely as McMahon would earn no money from the venture. So he barred Piper from being in the movie. So Piper quit. Good for him. Vince McMahon is a D bag, oh, horrible, a horrible D-bag. human being. Yeah, and what short sighted BS is that? Yeah, you know, let your wrestlers branch out. So bring some normies into your world of weirdness. You know, yeah. I mean, the movie did well. He Piper got more popular. He ended up wrestling with the WCW, and made them a ton of money. Yeah. So shockingly enough, Vince McMahon a couple years later asked him to come back. Of course, because yeah. you know what, green is good. <laughs> Piper had his first lead role in a film earlier in the year in the January 1988 release Hell Comes to Frogtown. Hell Comes to Frogtown. Have you ever seen Hell Comes to Frogtown? Yeah. So there's this <laughs> town where all these frogs live. And uh, all of a sudden, this big guy played by Rowdy Roddy Piper, his name is Dr. Fiends, uh, he comes down to this pond where all the frogs live to grab the frogs for experiments. And so they're like, you know, they have to fight against Dr. Freens uh, to save them and their lily pad lifestyle from being destroyed. So when Freens comes, he brings hell to Frogtown. Uh, surprisingly, that's pretty close. You just said it in the post-apocalyptic <laughs> era and you pretty much nailed it. <laughs> nice. The post-apocalyptic frog. <laughs> it's, it was not a good movie. <clears throat> uh, while other professional wrestlers have appeared in feature films, like Hulk Hogan as Thunderlips in Rocky Three. That's right, brother. <laughs> Andre the Giant and the Princess Bride, 1987. I don't think you know what that word means. And uh, Piper is credited with being the first professional wrestler to be cast in the lead of a film. Yeah. He was very proud of this and would go on and on and on about how he kickstarted the whole... All the pro wrestlers got to be in the movies. Oh, here comes Piper. He's going to start talking <laughs> about how he kickstarted all the wrestlers and movies. Hey, fellas. <laughs> how you doing? That's great. I, Did you tell you about the time I got into the movies? The very first job I ever had in L.A. was working for the G4 Network, and I was transcribing interviews. And the first interview I transcribed was with Rowdy Roddy Piper. Nice. For some wrestling game. 
They asked one question, and he talked for 25 minutes. <laughs> oh, I'm not surprised. <laughs> it, but he, the whole thing about him being young, and like he went all the way back. He told his whole life story to answer one question. It was really uh, to, tell this, to answer this question, we're going to have to go back to 1962. It was, it was great. <laughs> it was really cool to watch because he was just being himself. Oh, he was, was great. Yeah. I mean, love him or hate him, he was a genuine article. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, he, he was who he was. Guy had been through a lot, you know. Yeah. He, he wasn't. Some coddled. No, he earned everything yeah, he got. Exactly for sure. Uh, and he was very. He was a very honest man. Like he. He wouldn't. You'll notice in some of the shots that he has his a wedding ring on, which the character's not suppo- supposed to be like anonymous. Right. But he refused to take the wedding ring off because he had gotten married a few years earlier and he loved his wife and he was like, I'm not doing that. So Carpenter was like, Sure. Well, because he believed that when you took your ring off, you weren't married. <laughs> So he was really worried that if he took the ring off, his wife would cheat on him. All right. Fair. <laughs> Fair. Uh, the line, I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass and I'm all out of bubblegum, was ad-libbed by Rowdy Roddy Piper. Bubblegum. Uh, he had actually wrote it down in a journal. Uh, he would go on to use it while wrestling. He wrote down a bunch of one-liners because that's what they do in wrestling. Yeah. Uh, it would also be used by Duke Nukem in the video game series. Surprise, surprise. Yeah. Uh, after they live, Piper has appeared in over 40 movies and TV shows. Carpenter actually makes a joke on the DVD commentary about how Piper has more experience in movies than he does. I've only made 20, he says. Yeah, but you made 20 good ones, <laughs> replied Piper. They were great, great <laughs> movies. <laughs> he went very full Scottish later in his Sometimes life. Sometimes he does, yeah. Uh, or sometimes he just goes Canadian, eh? Yeah. Uh, when he's mellow. It's somewhere in between there. I know. Hey, I'm a Canadian, but I'm also from Scotland. I'm a Scottish Canadian. <laughs> he would just waver <laughs> back and forth. It was. It must have been confusing. Uh, unfortunately, Piper died from a heart attack in 2015 at the age of 61. Ah, so young. Yeah, yeah. It's that, it probably steroids, man. I mean, the stuff that yeah. they had to do. I mean, they, they... Even regardless if they're doing steroids, they abuse their bodies. Yes, painkillers and all sorts yeah, of stuff. It's just, just so much. Shoot them these full guys. of Demerol. Yeah, yeah, it was just they were basically stock. You know, they yeah. were like cow, oh, cattle, or horses. Exactly how Vince McMahon sees them. Yeah, he was just they were they were his cattle, and he would do whatever it needs to get them to the shoot. Yeah, yeah. They cast Keith David as Frank Armitage. Keith David, he's my favorite. <laughs> David made his feature film, film debut in The Thing, working with John Carpenter. Uh, he worked in TV for a few years, most notably on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood as Keith the Handyman. Nice. Yeah. He was cast in Oliver Stone's Platoon in 1986, and then after a memorable turn in Hot Pursuit in 1987, haha, David started getting booked. <laughs> he was booked. great. <laughs> he was fine. <laughs> he was great. David started getting booked for everything, appearing in five movies that were released in 1988, including They Live. Also including Braddock, Missing in Action 3, starring Chuck Norris. Chuck Norris. Yeah. Always following the other guys. Yeah, uh, yeah. Hey, I'm Chuck Norris. I'm always two steps behind. <laughs> Two steps behind Chuck. That's what they call him. Yeah. Off Limits, an action thriller starring Willem Dafoe and Gregory Hines. I don't know if you've uh, seen that. It was set uh, during Vietnam. Uh, probably. Or, or in Vietnam. I don't know if it was during Vietnam, but uh, yeah. Uh, Stars and Bars, a comedy starring Daniel Day-Lewis. Yeah. Never heard of this. No. Uh, and he was in Bird about Charlie Parker, directed by Clint Eastwood. That was great. Great movie. Yeah. Force Whitaker. Yeah. It's great movie. Bird. For They Live, Carpenter needed someone... Who wouldn't be a traditional sidekick, but could hold his own. To this end, Carpenter wrote the role of Frank specifically for David. David has appeared in over 300 projects on TV, film, and voiceover for video games. Yeah, I mean, he probably was like, I loved working with him on the thing. Yeah. I want to have my buddy back. They didn't work together again after this, which is really sad, because they, they do really good work together. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because of his love of video games, I heard he's adapting the, uh, he's going to adapt the movie version of the game Dig Dug. Oh, nice. And, I, and that's Keith a perfect David. role for Keith yeah. David is Dig Dug, digging them holes. Remember Dig Dug? How is it? Yes, I remember Dig Dug. How is it a perfect role for Keith David? Okay. So, <laughs> I don't know if you know this, but Keith David in his youth was a professional shoveler. Shoveler. Contest. Yeah. Okay. They would have shovel contests. Oh, uh, shovel contests. Yeah, in like places where it would snow. So they would have oh. these contests where they would give these guys shovels, and whoever could shovel the walk fastest won, and he won every single time. 
They um, used to call him Dig Dug. I'm going to disagree with you, because if he's shoveling snow, that is very different than dirt, which Dig Dug dug dirt. Dig Dug Dig Dug dirt. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm telling you, <laughs> he, he moved from snow to dirt. Okay. He wasn't just a... a it's not the same. Time they're, shoveler, very, baby. they're very different. He, Look, as he shoveled dirt, he shoveled grit, he shoveled uh, silt, he shoveled granite, and he shoveled kale. As someone, shale, shale, okay, kale. He shale. would shovel kale and kale. As someone uh, with a lifetime subscription to the shoveler enthusiast, Ooh. I know very much about how different these things can be when you're shoveling them. Touche. Okay. <laughs> All right. So they cast Meg Foster as Holly Thompson. Uh, funny enough, Holly Thompson, Meg Foster, is the only character that is actually given a name in the entire movie. Wow. She has the craziest eyes. Yeah. I mean, they're beautiful, but they're weird beautiful. It's funny because the second... And I remember this from the first time I saw it. I was probably too young. But the second she came on the screen, I was like, she has to be an alien or something like it was her eyes like were giving away the fact yeah. that she was like working with the bad guys she always seemed kind of like she, she always reminded me a little bit of uh kirstie alley like i'd get them mixed up a little bit okay okay back at the time foster is one of the few actors who has managed to not just hide their age but their actual birthday from the internet literally her entire birthday cannot be found all right well then she's 29 uh i'm gonna i'm gonna hazard a guess that she probably was born in 1950 uh, that's that's my thought. Her first credited appearance is in the 1970 movie Adam at 6 a.m., starring Michael Douglas and Joe Don Baker. Yeah, it was all about you and how oh, they had to get you up at 6 a.m. for school, and you were such a little snotty snot about it. And you're like, I don't want to get up. And they're like, get up, Adam. we got to get you up for school. And you're like, I ain't doing it. I ain't doing it. And you pull the covers all up over you, and then they have to pull the covers off, and then it was this whole thing. Ironically, I did get up at 6 a.m. this morning. <laughs> yeah, well, Nice. <laughs> Foster had just come off playing Evelyn in the Masters of the Universe adaptation in 1987. Ugh. I'm going to make you like that movie. Yeah, well, uh, we're going to do it. We're going to do the movie. <laughs> I'm going to hate watch it. It has that weird instrument. It's so cool. Mm-hmm. <laughs> She's gone on to appear in over 100 movies, TV shows, and TV movies over the years. She's appeared in more horror movies as of late, appearing in Lords of Salem and 31 for Rob Zombie. 31? I never heard of that one. Came out in 2016. What was it about? A bunch of serial killers. <laughs> what is every movie Rob Zombie does about? Mm-hmm. I think it's. I think it was supposed to be the third, or like it was connected somehow to his previous movies. I thought it was the origin of Baskin Robbins. Yeah. One flavors. Yeah, it was. But, but they're serial killers. That was the whole thing. Well, they each like a different flavor. Right. Yes. So, you know, like uh, John Wayne Gacy was Praline Dream. That was his favorite. And, <laughs> Gross. <laughs> and uh, Jeffrey Dahmer like Rainbow Sherbet. She most recently can be seen in Hellblazers starring Bruce Dern, Billy Zane, Tony Todd, Courtney Gaines, and Adrian Barbeau. Nice. Courtney Gaines is awesome. Yeah, he's a cool dude. Uh, we met him a couple times. He used to be the musical guest sometimes for our comedy group, The Choops. Nice. Nice. Yeah, he's a very nice guy. He's a good dude. And a great actor. And Children of the Corn. Oh, my God. So good. Uh, and she can also be seen in the upcoming Haunted 333, also starring Courtney Gaines and Corin Nemec. Ooh, from, uh, uh, what was that show that he did? Uh, Corky's All Right? No. no um, oh, uh, Parker Lewis. Parker Lewis Can't Lose. Parker Lewis Can't Lose. That was such a great show. I love that show. <laughs> it was a great show. Uh, Raymond St. Jacques uh, was cast as the street preacher. After appearing in bit parts on television in the early 1960s, St. Jacques made his film debut in a small part in the 1964 film Black Like Me. St. Jacques' best known film roles were that of Coffin Ed in the black exploitation classics Cotton Comes to Harlem in 1970 and Come Back Charleston Blue in 1972. In the early 1970s, St. Jacques began teaching fencing and acting at the Mufundi Institute in Watts, Los Angeles. In 1973, he produced, directed, and starred in the crime film Book of Numbers. St. Jock frequently spoke of the prejudices he and other African-American actors faced and difficulties in being cast in non-stereotypical, thoughtful roles. Yeah, and this isn't that long ago. No, no. He later worked to help African-Americans find work behind the camera. In 1977, he publicly criticized the lack of minority actors in Star Wars, which he stated he saw five times, and other science fiction films. He wasn't wrong. Yeah. During his career, St. Jacques appeared frequently in plays by Shakespeare, 
uh, he played Othello a number of times, and and actually was I think he was Romeo and Romeo and Juliet. A little long in the tooth to be playing Romeo. Yeah, yeah. Um, I didn't know Romeo was fifty. Well, it was over his whole career. So, okay. I mean, yeah. After they live, he appeared in Ed Zwick's Glory as Frederick Douglass. Nice. I loved that movie. It was such a good movie. It was glorious. It's g- glorious. Unfortunately, he passed from lymphoma in 1990. Ah. Yeah. George Buck Flower was cast as the drifter slash collaborator. Uh, <laughs> hey, boys. <laughs> Why don't you come? I'm going to show you everything that they do. Oh, come on gosh. in. Let me give you a tour and explain every single thing about the plow. <laughs> 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 Flower is an actor, writer, producer, assistant director, production manager, and casting director. He's worked on over 100 productions. Because he has a gruff appearance, he was constantly cast as homeless or drunk. Nice. He first worked with John Carpenter on The Fog in 1980. I played a homeless drunk! (laughs) He would make cameos for Carpenter in five more movies, including They Live. I was a drunken homeless guy there. uh, Escape from New York in 1981. Futuristic drunk homeless guy! Starman in 1984. Ooh, homeless drunkie from outer space. Uh, Body Bags, a TV movie in 1993, co-directed by Toby Hooper. Drunk. Dead, drifting, homeless guy. And Village of the Damned in 1995. Just a damned old drunken homeless guy. (laughs) Flower appeared in a very different alien movie, Mac and Me, in 1987, just before they live. Oh, God. Have you seen that? Of course. Mac and Me, for those of you who don't know, (laughs) was this McDonald's-produced ripoff of E.T. And most people know this. Because of a running gag that yeah. Paul Rudd has done on every variation of the Conan O'Brien show right. up until his podcast, <laughs> where he would tell Conan, oh, yeah, I got a clip of the show, or I got something. And it would always be the shot from Mac and me of the little wheelchair boy going down the hill, falling off the hill <laughs> into the water. And then the, the worst puppet ever made, oh, Mac. so bad. Was it Mac was the Mac, alien? Yeah. Or was me the alien? No, no it, Mac. Was Mac. it was Mac. It was Mac. And he pops up. It's so... That one scene it, it encapsulates that movie perfectly. <laughs> if, if one scene can encapsulate a movie perfectly, it's that more so than any other movie yep. ever. Yeah. And, it's you know, really bad. Paul Rudd is given a lot of legs to yes, Mac and me. Yes, he uh, has. So Flower is also well known for playing Red the Bum in Back to the Future and Back to the Future Part 2. I should the bum. I wasn't drinking too much in those movies because yeah. he's PG. He just uh, he saw the car. He's the only one that saw the car come back and forth multiple times. I got to quit drinking. That's like one of those <laughs> shots that they did in everything where the guy sees something crazy. He <laughs> looks at his bottle and then tosses it away. <laughs> <laughs> I better stop drinking. Uh, unfortunately, Flower passed from cancer in 2004 at the age of 66. Okay, that's super sad. But he was only 66? He looked like he was 66 and they live. I know. Which means... That means he was... Younger than both of us. He was in his early 30s or late 20s when he was doing this. He's one of those people. I mean, look at at Angela Lansbury, man. She was playing 60 for like 50 years. Yeah. She played... uh, She played Frank Sinatra's mom when she was like two years older. Yes, then. yes. Manchurian Candy, such a good movie. Yes. <clears throat> they cast Peter Jason as Gilbert, one of the revolutionaries. Gilbert. <laughs> Jason is one of the few actors who have act- to actually have been born in Hollywood, being raised in Newport Beach. He's the ultimate character actor and one of those faces you recognize but can never name. Jason appeared in a number of Western TV shows in the late 60s before being cast in his first feature, Rio Lobo, a film by Howard Hawks, starring John Wayne. He was really good in that. Uh, He's worked with Walter Hill and John Carpenter almost exclusively, not exclusively, he's in a ton of other stuff. He's worked with them a lot. Uh, Walter Hill films nine of them, The Driver in 1978, The Long Riders in 1980, 48 Hours in 1982, Streets of Fire in 1984, Brewster's Millions in 1985, which I forgot was a Walter Hill movie. Yeah, what is going on with him? (laughs) Red Heat in 1988, a great Schwarzenegger Belushi movie. I'm from Russia. I'm Russian. Johnny Handsome in 1989, which I don't think I've seen. It sounded familiar. Johnny Handsome was pretty good. I think that was starring Mickey Rourke. Yes. If I'm not. Yes. And he was like a a criminal or something that was disfigured. and It wasn't bad. Wild Bill in 1995 and Undisputed in 2002. 
He's also appeared in six John Carpenter films, including They Live, Prince of Darkness in 1987, In the Mouth of Madness of, in 1994, Village of the Damned in 95, Escape from L.A. in 96, and Ghosts of Mars in 2001. He's also done a number of voiceover roles for video games. He was in two Wing Commander games. And he played Sergeant Dornan in Fallout 2. Nice! And he did a few voices for Gears of War 2 and Gears of War 3. He's appeared in almost 300 projects during his very long career. He most recently was known for playing Con Stapleton in the HBO series Deadwood. He's also got that face that's yeah. like very, he looks like a nice guy. Yeah, he looks like, yeah, he looks like somebody you just want to hang out with. Yeah, yeah. he's just kind of like, hi, come on in and have some burgers. <laughs> his most recent credit is the Deadwood movie that came out a few years ago. He is still actively working. He just doesn't have it, haven't had anything recently. He was in Justified. He was great in that play in Own Cards. But uh, I still need to watch that. I Justify so good. good things. Yeah, it's one of my favorites. Uh, Peter Jason is fantastic. Yeah, everything he does, he shows up in everything. Like, everything. I mean, the man has worked nonstop <laughs> since like 1965. He was in Baskets. His Uncle Jim. Oh, what? That's right. Yeah, God, I love that show. It so messed up. <laughs> I love that <laughs> yes. show. <laughs> Uh, Cy Richardson was cast as the Black Revolutionary. Uh, Richardson made his film debut as the Fairy Godmother in the 1977 American erotic musical comedy Cinderella. (laughs) (laughs) I've never seen this. I kind of have to find it. I have no idea. Uh, He's perhaps best known as a regular in the films of Alex Cox, having appeared in Repo Man in 1984, Sid and Nancy in 1986, Straight to Hell in 1987, Walker in 1987 as well, The Winner in 1996, and Searchers 2.0 in 2007. Searchers 2.0? Yep. Is that like a sequel to the John Wayne movie, The Searchers? I don't think so. I think it was some internet-based thing. I've never seen it. These last four movies, I've never seen. Okay. (laughs) I don't know. I, I think I've seen Straight to Hell. Yeah, I mean, probably. I, 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 yes, I wouldn't say I probably have too, but uh, I don't recall. He recently had a recurring role as the coroner on the TV series Pushing Daisies. He's appeared in over 100 projects and continues to work despite being in his early 80s. They Live was shot in eight weeks during March and April in 1988, principally on location in downtown Los Angeles with a budget only slightly greater than $3 million. Which is insane, but also it's so funny to watch these movies in Los Angeles back then oh, because yeah. it's you look and you say... There's some buildings missing from the skyline here. There's a lot of buildings missing, yeah. Some of the biggers. Carpenter Carpenter brought real homeless people into the production for several scenes and smaller characters and gave them food as well as paychecks. I was going to say. Gave them food. (laughs) It's it's literally... They just get these homeless guys. We'll give them some sandwiches. A couple of... I do. (laughs) Give them some bourbon. I like that they make it seem like he's like a great person for this when there's literally a caterer in every production. (laughs) Yeah, but he paid them. I know, he he did pay them. He didn't just pay them in food. Uh, Yeah. yeah. I mean, and it's great. Look, honestly, to to give... You know, people work and give some, give know. them a little money. Yeah, it's it. it you know, they, I'm sure some people were were very thankful. The big fight, <laughs> <laughs> the big fight sequence was designed, rehearsed, and choreographed in the backyard of director John Carpenter's production office. The fight between Nada and Frank was only supposed to last 20 seconds, but Piper and David decided to fight it out for real, only faking the hits to the face and groin. Every body blow you see in that movie is real. <laughs> What a bunch of weirdos, no. which is one of the best fights ever. And it's it's funny because when we were watching it, Phoebe's like, why is everybody just don't want to put these glasses on? <laughs> and she's right. <laughs> but it was their metaphor for people don't want change. Yep. You know, they it's don't like they don't the want to see the yeah. truth. They'll yeah. fight tooth and nail. And I think that this fight, as gratuitous <laughs> as it was, oh, yeah, was yeah. the perfect metaphor oh, no, for people not wanting to face up to the truth. They rehearsed it. And it got longer and longer and longer. And then they rehearsed it for like three weeks. And then they presented it to Carpenter. And he was like, I'm going to do the whole thing. I'm not cutting anything. Because they literally were like, just cut it down to what you want. And he was like, nope, whole thing. But it's (laughs) the beginning. Nada, which is kind of a weird name for Rowdy Roddy Piper. Let's be honest. (laughs) I love it. Means nothing in Spanish. Yeah. Uh, He's nobody. Yeah. He is nobody. He's nada. He's nothing. Nada. Um, At the beginning, he's like, he wants his friend to see the truth. I want you to see it. And by the end, they're literally trying to murder each other. 
You know? I mean, they're hitting each other with like, glass. I mean, it's, it I, gets way out of control. It had, that fight sequence has one of the best reactions, the best acting that Roddy Piper's ever done when he breaks the car window and realizes that it's Keith David's car and he's just like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. <laughs> like, puts it down. He's like, all of it's forgotten. He's just like, nope. He's like, that's too far. <laughs> oh, it was so good. Yeah, he was so impressed. Carpenter was so impressed that he kept the scene intact. It runs a total of five minutes and 20 seconds. It feels like it runs it forever. It feels like 15. Yeah. Because fight scene, I mean, there's few movies that can pull off really good, long, sustained fight scenes. Yeah. I would say this. Old Boy, the fight scene in the corridor is one oh, of the best fight oh. scenes ever with the hammer. Oh, oh my, my God. God. So um, but I love those scenes that just go on so long. It gets to the point where, like... It's got to stop. But then <laughs> it goes so far that it's good again. Yeah. And yeah, you don't want yeah. it to stop. Right. It's like the Peter fighting the, the chicken in, uh, <laughs> yes, in Family Guy. Yes. <laughs> where it, it, that one episode where it just it like happened and you're like, oh, it's going to last like 10 seconds. And it's literally the rest of the episode. And you, it, it has to be based on this. I mean, yes, they had yes. to have been influenced by oh, They yeah, Live for that yeah. chicken scene. Oh, yeah. The aliens are from Andromedon, as George Buckflower explains at the transportation device after being zhuzhed up by the aliens, which is... You, Andromedon? You did, you did it very well earlier, where he literally explains the entire plot. <laughs> <laughs> Just goes in and goes, hey guys, I'm the guy in the suit now to tell you how things are. Let me tell you. Yeah. Uh, shout out to Titus Andromedon on Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. Uh, I don't know if they took it from this, but... Uh, oh, he is so good. Titus Burgess. There you go. Yeah. Tyson Burgess, he's fantastic. Absolutely fantastic actor. They need um, to put him in more stuff. I miss him. I know. I, I, I don't know if he got the name from They Live for Tyson Andromedon or the writers did, but I want to believe they did. <laughs> I, so. I just want to believe they did. <laughs> it would seem like something that Tina Fey would I do. I think Tina Fey is a fan of They Live, yeah. I would like that. I, I would too. Uh, all the various aliens throughout the movie, both male and female, were, were portrayed by stunt coordinator Jeff Amata, except when multiple aliens were on screen. Well, because he can only be one person, Adam. Yes, I know. He played the ghouls who had close-ups and speaking parts. Uh, Carpenter went on record saying that he could just fit in the clothes, so they made him do nice. it. <laughs> That's how it works. Uh, the aliens were designed to look like they were slowly rotting away to show the undercurrent of corruption. What are you looking at? <laughs> I, we have one that can see. Uh, uh, yeah. Always the watches. I think there were so many cool things Apple about this Watch. movie. Yeah. They, they gave us Apple Watches, <laughs> they though. Did. Yeah. It was worth it. And look, man, they want us just to eat and watch TV. I'm so bad about that. <laughs> wow. You would be a sympathizer. <laughs> yeah, I would be. <laughs> You'll notice in some of the shots that the alien guards are using something that looks suspiciously like a PKE meter from Ghostbusters. <laughs> Uh, in this case, it was designed to not find ghosts, but people. <laughs> yeah, it was a people PK meter. Yes. Uh, it was also used in the Hulk Hogan movie Suburban Commando in 1991 and appeared in a few episodes of Knight Rider. Fun things about the PKE meter I did <laughs> yeah. not know. <laughs> it has a better career than a lot of actors. Oh my God, that's true. <laughs> Uh, the sunglasses are called Hoffman lenses, named after Alfred Hoffman, the creator of LSD. Nice. That's actually pretty awesome. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and say that Carpenter probably dropped a few hits once in a while. Sure. I, I don't think that's... Uh, He's got the, the open-mindedness of a man who's done hallucinogens. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Originally scheduled for an October 21st, 1988 release date, the film was moved to November 4th in order to avoid competition with Halloween 4, The Return of Michael Myers. Which is... Probably a good idea, even though he's competing against his own franchise. Yeah. Uh, ironically, Carpenter had been producer and co-writer of the first three Halloween films, directed the first, obviously, but Halloween 4 was the first in the series that he made and was made entirely without his involvement. Well, that's why it blew. Uh, <laughs> I don't remember which one that was about. I don't know. They just, after Halloween 3 and not having Michael Myers, they had to really make sure that you knew Michael Myers was coming back. Yeah, this one was all about... Michael Myers moving to a new city, <laughs> and he's a fish out of water. Gets he a new, thought, gets a new job at that lawyer firm. <laughs> until he finds a girl he wants to kill, <laughs> but he ends up falling in love. Aww. Michael Myers in Halloween 4, Sex in the City. <laughs> Would have been a better movie than Halloween 4, The Return of Michael Myers. Yep. They Live debuted at number one at the box office, growing $4.8 million during its opening weekend. Uh, the film spent two weeks in the top ten. Despite this, it would only go on to make around $13 million in North America. Still a profit. It only cost yeah. $3 million to make. I mean, it made its money back, for sure. A million of that was on 
sunglasses. <laughs> Carpenter was uh, shocked that it opened at number one. He was convinced it wouldn't, uh, or that it wouldn't do well at all. Well, yeah, because it's a difficult film. I mean, yeah. Rod- Rowdy Roddy Piper wasn't a tested leading man at this point. He was just a wrestler, and wrestlers didn't, you know, like you said, they didn't. No, uh, they, you know, they didn't charge they the box office. They like weren't they leading now. Men. No, and it was a difficult film about difficult issues. You know, it's it's this this uh, seemingly simple science fiction film with all right. these complex anti-consumerism, anti-fascist elements to it that made it such a great film. Yeah, yeah. And you know what? People don't like complicated, Adam. <laughs> Well, it's obviously gone on to be a huge cult classic. Uh, it's cast a very long shadow over pop culture. Shepard Ferry, the artist, credits the film as a major source of inspiration, sharing a similar logo to his Andre the Giant Has a Posse campaign. Oh, yeah. Uh, the whole Obey thing. Yeah, uh, yeah. He said, They Live was the basis for my use of the word Obey. The movie has a very strong message about the power of commercialism and the way people are manipulated by advertising. Yes, Shepard Fairy, that is correct. I'm Shepard Fairy. <laughs> the 2013 video game Saints Row 4 features an extended parody of They Live with Rowdy Piper and Keith David voicing fictionalized versions of themselves in a recreation of the fight scene between Nada and Armitage. Oh, God, it's so good. That's also I the don't g- remember this. Oh, God. Well, there's a whole alien invasion part right, of right. Saints Row 4, and this is also the game that has... <laughs> that has uh, Burt Reynolds oh, is the yeah, mayor. That's right. And you could just hang out with Burt Reynolds. This drive game. around. Oh, I got to play this again. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I do. Now I totally forgot about the they live. They live thing. Part. Yeah. Now I got to do it. Yeah. South Park recreated the entire fight scene shot for shot with Jimmy and Timmy fighting. If you remember that. <laughs> yes, that was amazing. Two kids in wheelchairs, or no, one, one in a wheelchair. One in crushes. One, one in crushes. Wheelchair. You're right. Sorry. <laughs> but them fighting literally shot for shot was fantastic. Hey, hey, have you heard this one? Have you heard this one? <laughs> Timmy! Yeah, it was a good fight. In 2010, there was development on a remake of the film with Carpenter in a producing role. In 2011, Matt Reeves of Cloverfield signed on to direct and write the screenplay. Nope. The project also shifted away from being a remake of They Live to a re-adaptation of 8 O'Clock in the Morning, ditching the satirical and political elements. Since then, there have been no new amount announcements. Yeah, we don't need it. We don't need it. This film is great. I love that it, they decided that they were like, you know what? We're not going to make a remake of They Live. We're going to strip away everything that made it memorable. Yeah, <laughs> let's take out the fun and just make it a grueling, gross thing. That's the thing. I mean, that's the that's what we talked about with uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. They take the fun out of these remakes and make them these gritty, realistic portrayals or whatever. Yeah. And what makes this so much fun Look, this movie is vegetables, yeah. but it's vegetables deep fried with a bunch of cheese and meat around it, you know? Right, right. So those are the best kind of movies. Same thing it's with South Park. It's the same kind movie. of thing. Yeah. You hide your message in there, and like a pill and some peanut right. butter for a right. dog. Yeah. And we see it. This movie is so much fun. It's such a great encapsulation of Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. Of the time. Oh, yeah. And, and yeah. the parts of Los Angeles that you never see in movies, the homeless camps, the downtown yeah. areas, the the non-glamorous parts of L.A., the parts right. of L.A. that people try to hide. Yeah. This was all in full display in this movie. It, it was a champion of homelessness. Mm-hmm. It was a champion of a bunch of different things. And it just started and didn't stop. Oh, yeah. As soon yeah. as he comes with his big old backpack and his giant... Sleeping bag. <laughs> and the music. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah, it's like it's this, just so like weird, it's depressing. Got this techno blues. Mm, you know. You know, and he's moping around looking for work, looking yeah, for whatever. It the movie has so much it this is the brilliance of a great director because he knew what he wanted to make. Yeah. And everything that happens in the movie supports that theme. And the movie is still Prescient today. It still yes. works today because we still have the homeless issues. We still have the economic issues. Yeah. We still have the economic disparity. And we definitely have a media that's telling us to consume and watch TV and do all this yeah. stuff. Except they don't have to use subliminal no, advertising because no, no. we're just like, okay, okay right, let's we'll give me some Big Macs yeah. and watch me some Netflix. I just, I love the fact that 
the whole movie is shot downtown except for the part where he goes to Holly's house, which yeah. is obviously like in the Hollywood Hills somewhere. And the metaphor is that when he's there, he literally gets thrown out a window down a hill. Yeah. You are not good enough for this. No, <laughs> you don't throwing you here. out. And then what yeah. a great – I mean, <laughs> could you imagine – Throwing rowdy, little old, what's her name? <laughs> Holly, uh, Meg Foster. Little, little tiny Meg Foster throws giant old rowdy, rowdy Piper through a window <laughs> and he falls like, I don't know, a story and a half. At least. It's on stilts. Boom. Hits the, the ground ro- uh, on the back, rolly, rolly, rolly down the hill. And, and he just gets up. Hides. <laughs> Time to go. <laughs> I'm going to go hang out for a bit. And then literally the next day gets into a 45 minute fight with, right. with his best friend. Yeah, I guess. I guess. I don't know whoever he is. They're yeah. now best friends. Sometimes you got to beat up a guy to become best friends. That's that happened true. to me in grade school. Oh, yeah. Beat yeah. up a kid. We got sent to the principal's office and became best pals. Also, really sad with uh, – there's little – rewatching it again, there was little lines that I totally forgot about. Like the fact that Frank, the Keith David character, talks about how he's married and has kids. Yeah. By the end – spoiler alert – by the end – Everybody's dead. Yeah, everybody. Like, it's just like, oh, my God. Yeah. I feel so bad. And the way he dies is just so sad. It's so sad. Well, it's kind of off screen, too. It's, yeah, Meg Foster pops she up. She shoots him. Yeah. And that's when you know. You know, those freaky eyes, man. Yeah, I never <laughs> trust those eyes. Never trust Meg Foster. It just, I totally, there were so many. I forgot that he gets thrown out the window. Like, yeah. That is a long fall. Well, it's just crazy that such a fun movie is such a bleak <laughs> it's so bleak, depressing. But that's Carpenter. But, Carpenter but does such they, a good job of portraying yeah. everything out of whack. Like yeah. he, Escape from New York is an amazing treatise on you know one percent versus ninety nine percent. And right, it's right. like, well, screw it. We're just gonna wall off New York and make it a prison. <laughs> you know why not? Why not? But he is so good at. He does such a good job of creating tension. Yeah. And dra- like yeah. the thing. Yes. You know? Yes. The thing is the is the most effective movie about paranoia I yeah. think I've ever yeah. seen. Yeah. And it is again a metaphor of the other and you never right. know. Yeah, they're they're political without being political. And, and they're fun. They're and they're fun. they're good. Yeah, he's this is the movies that he did that that don't have that don't succeed as well. Yeah, I mean look at Big Trouble in Little China. You know, he took the whole trope of the the you know hero yeah and yeah. threw it on his head yeah, you know the big yeah. white hero coming in to save everybody <laughs> well he, he's not as good nope, as the other nope. guys and he's got to get saved yeah. so he's always kind of had that really he's always kind of had a edge to him where he zigs where other people zag right right and the real there's a look a lot of directors have initial success mm-hmm. they make a movie that makes 150 million dollars yeah. and that movie is forgotten in three years right Carpenter makes these movies that at the time are ahead of their time, a little right. bit challenging, not because they're, you know, hoity-toity or anything. No, no. But they're not easily put into a box and easily sold, yeah. you yeah. know, through McDonald's cheeseburgers. Right. So right. these movies, have, they have this lasting impression of, of people that are, uh, that are curious and people that want right. to, you know, right. uh, See things that are different and want to do that extra work, yeah. right? Yeah, and so these movies stand the test of time because all of them are evergreen in terms of the yeah. themes and everything that's going on. The thing could yeah. be yeah. the same thing today with very little difference, right? Right. Uh, they live the same thing, you know, with very yeah. little difference. The, these things last because the issues that he tackles are <laughs> issues that never go away, right? Right. And it is, it is. They are challenging, but but accessible, and they do get to the point that you have that when you kind of figure out what's going on or like what it means, you have that satisfaction of like, oh yeah, it actually. I had to look for this. I yeah. had to find this and work for it. And it just makes you appreciate the movies that much more. And his really good movies, and I say his best are Escape from New York, The Thing, They Live, and uh, uh, Big Trouble Big Trouble in Little China. Yeah. Those yeah. are probably the top four. Yeah. And they're classics. Yeah, absolute and classics. they should yeah. not be remade. Because yeah. Yeah. there's a certain type of director that makes a movie a certain way. And he is a guy that his movies are his movies. If you see a John Carpenter movie, you know it's yeah. a John Carpenter movie. Not just because of the music, right, which right. is awesome. <laughs> but he he has a way of doing stuff. And remaking those movies without his themes and without his underlying persona yeah, yeah. 
it just misses the mark. It's just no, I cares? agree. I agree, and it's not yeah because you're you're just trying to do something that somebody else does, and that and that that's what a good director you can't you can't replicate a good director. You can't I mean, remake E. T. Yeah, you can't remake the thing. You can't remake Star Wars. You, you can't. You, you can't know, remake Psycho. Like it's no. Not, you can't. You could try. <laughs> they did. <laughs> shot for shot. Uh, not really kind shot of. Shot. But like. But yeah. But it's it, that's the thing, and that and and that's why every movie after the original Halloween was okay. I yeah. mean, Halloween two. But he didn't direct any of them, and it, no. it's they just they tried to be him, and they couldn't because they weren't. Yeah. Um, it, it's. I mean, Halloween is a different. These franchises that become out of control, sure, sure, they are what they are, but they're never going to be the original Halloween. But he this was a dread was, with the original Halloween. Yeah, yeah, it's such a perfect little movie because it's just this crazy guy escapes from an yeah. asylum and goes after the neighborhood. I right, mean, it's right. very self-contained and it makes sense. Yeah. You know, all of his movies are very self-contained and they make sense. Yeah, yeah, and. Uh, and he's just one of the best filmmakers of the 80s. And Agreed. I love him, and I want to play video games with him. <laughs> Maybe we can play Red Dead Online with him or something. Yeah. I mean, he's only he hasn't directed anything since uh, Ghosts of Mars, but he did all the music for the last three Halloween movies. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's released a bunch of albums since 2009. Look, that guy can do whatever he wants. He's done. He's given us some of the greatest films of the 80s that live on today. Some of my favorite films, my absolute favorite horror mm-hmm. film, The Thing, they Live is one of my, you know, Escape from New York is brilliant. I can't wait for yeah, us to yeah. do that. It's just Carpenter is one of the greatest American filmmakers, and I also believe he is extremely underrated. Agreed. And I think people just, you know, uh, I think people just dismiss him as a horror filmmaker. Or right. A, this right. filmmaker. Yeah. Like Schlocky. That weird sci-fi. Yeah. Violent violent movie. Weird. Yeah. Beats and who knows what that music is? It's just a bunch <laughs> of beeps and bloops. Well, that's what did you see at the end of They Live? They the announcers after all the stuff comes up, and you can hear announcers talking about how movies have gotten so violent, like George Romero movies and John Carpenter movies, and it's yeah. like, yeah, he knows, like yeah. he knows. It's just fun. <laughs> watch the, if you haven't seen it, watch it because it's a really great movie, and it's a very telling movie about consumerism. Yeah. And it, it's a great metaphor. It's done in such a really fun way. It's the best thing Roddy Rowdy Piper's ever done. Uh, and oh, yeah. <laughs> it made me really like that. I've, I was a fan of, of Rowdy Roddy Piper's yeah. from that movie Same. on. Same. Watch I, anything that he did. I watched, he, him, I watched him wrestle because I wanted to see, I wanted to see that guy from yes, that movie. He was yeah. awesome. Look, yeah. there's nobody better than Carpenter when it comes to this kind of stuff. And I'm really glad that we're covering him because he needs to be... He needs some more attention. He needs yeah. to get a little yeah. bit more love from the Agreed. Hollywood world, and let's not shove him under the rug. He's the man. He is. And All we're right. going to be doing more of his yeah, movies. Yeah, we'll be back next week with uh, Total Recall. Yeah. Uh, very excited about Total Recall. Ah, that's Total Recall. Oh, my God. But I remember everything because I'm Total Recall. I cannot wait to talk about the... <laughs> commentary the dvd commentary with arnold schwarzenegger and either rennie harlan or yonder rennie harlan i think anyway they both have accents and oh yeah the whole time is just arnold literally saying what's on screen uh, look uh, there's a woman with three breasts <laughs> here i am going up the uh, stairs uh, look look at me uh, they, they put me into a chair and then look they, they strapped me down in the chair and i couldn't get out i was really strapped in but if i would have said hey i need to get out to go to take a pee then they wouldn't strap me and let me go pee. Yeah, he because I'm just an actor. I'm not really the person. Points in the out movie. that he's literally using someone as a human shield. <laughs> it's like uh, you can hear the director like, yeah, we were literally watching it. <laughs> oh, look at this part. I remember this part. It was very, 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 very scary because Sharon Stone is super mean to me I, all the time. I really like Arnold Schwarzenegger, but it's just <laughs> laughably humorous. Oh, he's anyway, great. we'll be back next week with Total Recall. <laughs> Car- uh, Carpenter has always been a, uh, I just said that Pipe, uh, Roddy Piper whose real name is Roderick George Toombs We now return you to your regularly scheduled programming Blossom already in progress <laughs> <laughs>